As I mentioned in Sunday school, uh, Cheryl and I plan to leave this uh, this Tuesday morning and uh, to visit my mom and dad in West Virginia, and then uh, uh, we'll leave on Sunday morning, the next Sunday, and drive over to her parents in southern Indiana and spend a few days there with her parents and Lord willing be home October the 30th on Thursday. Uh, so keep us in prayer in our travelings. We look forward to spending time with mom and dad. And I promised to get a haircut while in West Virginia, so get shaved. Once in a while, I like going into, uh, I was telling a few other folks but uh, already that uh, the barber shop that I used to get a haircut at when I was a little boy, it's still there. Uh, with the, with the, the barber pole out back, out front, and right off the corner of Main Street, and it looks just like Mary, Mary, Mayberry in a lot of ways. And you, you walk in this old barber shop, and the the black and white checkered floor is still there, the tile, these gargantuan 5,000 pound barber's chairs there is still, and the old barber, hot cream. And he takes his straight razor out still, the leather strap. It's probably 90 by now. <laughs> and I'm sure I'll still need the booster seat, so. I wanted to get that out before someone else does. <laughs> but I look, I look forward to time with mom and dad, and, and uh, so keep us in prayer. Acts chapter 11, we are in verses 27 through chapter 12, verse 5, uh, preaching verse by verse on Sunday morning through the book of Acts. And once we get to the first Sunday after Thanksgiving, we'll pause for five Sundays in a row, five or six Sundays in a row, look at the gospel narratives of the Christmas story, and then we'll pick Acts back up again in January and take it all the way to May. Acts chapter 11, verses 27 through chapter 12, verse 5. I just titled this sermon, Persevering Through Hard Times is Ministry. Let me read these verses and then explain what's on my heart from this text. Luke uh, comes to a point where he, he, he wants to actually summarize, and it's a transition from the long story of Cornelius' household and the salvation that br came to that household and, and how the Jews had to understand and, and was praising God that, uh, that God is bringing Gentile believers in. And it's been lots of, we've heard lots of exciting words and very upbeat and positive things have been taking place in the last several sermons. And then now verse 27. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And, and I want you to remember, uh, as we read the book of Acts, I'm not sure if I've actually mentioned this. When you read that phrase, came down from Jerusalem, that's like someone up in Green Bay, Wisconsin saying, and they came down from Chicago to Green Bay. Because Green Bay, I mean, Brett Favre, I mean, come on. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I want to get stoned in my own church. <laughs> the point is, is that Jerusalem is, is, a, is a long way south from Antioch, and it sits right on the Mediterranean. It's got almost very little elevation. But, it's, but Jerusalem is exalted in Scripture because it is the city on the hill that God has planted. And so all the language throughout the Bible, and here we are in the New Testament, it uses the language that if you're not in Jerusalem, you have to go up to it, even though you're going down to it, and even though it's lower than where you are. It's because it's, it's an exalted city in God's eyes. Now, in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem, went north to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world, and that is the known world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone, according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea, back down to Jerusalem. And they did so, 
or back up to Jerusalem, we should say, and they did so, sending it to the elders, those are the pastors, by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. And of course, we know that this is the Apostle Paul still receiving uh, and being remarked by his Old Testament Hebrew name. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, and when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. And may the Lord bless his word. Not to jump ahead, but we'll, we'll be there when we get there in chapter 14. One of the first verses in the book of Acts that I memorized when I was young, younger uh, was Acts chapter 14. And there's a verse in, from verses 19 through 23, 23 where the apostle Paul says, he just got stoned by the citizens of Lystria, and he goes back in there, <laughs> he dusts himself and he goes back, goes back in, and he meets with the disciples and encourages them, strengthens them in the faith, and there's that famous verse that Luke gives us from the Apostle Paul himself, through much tribulation we shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Tribulation, hard times is normal, folks. It's normal. It's normal. So when I title this Persevering Through Hard Times is Ministry, I, I mean to say that hard times are not distractions from living for the Lord. Have you ever started having a good day and just something just, just it's in your face and, and literally you're scrambling to make the day work? It's over with. Your plans are done. And we tend to think that this distraction is something other than getting on with the main business of living for Jesus or our church family uh, as a ministry, Grace Community Church. At, here we are in Yorkville in Kendall County. And we think that uh, some kind of hardship that is, is a distraction from the main business of ministry. And I think what we need to learn from this text today, and I think what Luke is helping us to see, is that hard times is ministry. It's not being derailed, and now you're off course from, you know, living for Christ or, or sticking with the main business of the church, but rather, hardship and tribulation is ministry. And so we uh, can be encouraged and not discouraged that just because um, the sump pump didn't work, and my basement flooded, and it's changed the next three days in my life. And then we can get back to, you know, life. No, that is life. Hardship is normal, and persevering through the hardship is ministry, whether it be as a church, as a corporate body of believers, or or as a parachurch organization like Pregnancy Information Center or Wayside Cross Ministries, or, or personal things in your own life. Uh, here we are. We are on a road of persevering through hard times, and it is ministry. It's normal. Um, so I'm, I'm not much of a how-to person, but I'm just going to start it off like this. How to persevere through hard times, and I've got a few things to share with you in your sermon outline. How to persevere through hard times. Here are some things that that Luke is helping us to see because it was just so good. I mean, Cornelius and Peter and, and, and praising and celebrating and going back to Antioch and telling what the Lord is doing. And then now there's a famine. James has been murdered and Peter is in prison. <laughs> there goes the air out of the balloon. But this is still ministry. Number one, don't focus on discovering the spiritual lesson. I'm not saying there aren't spiritual lessons, but follow me. Don't focus on discovering the spiritual lesson, but rather focus on faithful obedience. I want you to look at verse 27 again, how Luke, 
of this medical doctor who loves Jesus Christ and will become a lifelong companion beside the Apostle Paul, look how matter-of-factly he just states what's going on. Now in these days the prophets came down. Verse 20, one named this, stood up and foretold by God's Spirit, a famine is coming. Verse 29, so... There it is. Let's get to work. He doesn't elaborate. He doesn't go into lots of details. He doesn't answer questions. Why is there a famine breaking out? And the implications of it. And what is God trying to teach me through this famine? Uh, what? Grow a big garden? Maybe. But it's not there. And I doubt that's what he's wanting you to do anyway. Maybe. He's just going through, and then he just, he just mentions, and James is killed. He just gives uh, two verses to it, and then immediately, that's it, moves on. And Peter has been put in prison, and now the church is praying. But up, but up, but up, but up, but up, just done. I think Luke wants us to see as he moves forward in his narrative that um, our main responsibility during hard times. Our main responsibility during hard times is not figuring out the whys and the wherefores, but following through with God's directive for faithful living. There's a famine coming. They meet. What are we going to do about it? Can you give? And we'll say something about that in a moment because it's, it's a normal tra uh, movement uh, in the narrative. But I just read this, and, and, and I just, I'm encouraged that, you know what, I, I think I need, if, I, if I could focus on just being obedient. What does God want me to do next? And if there is a secret, special, spiritual lesson embedded in the trial and the hardship, then the you know, Lord re reveal it to me. But you know what? I, I need to be obedient today. What does God call me to do today? I'm a dad. I'm a father. I'm a neighbor. I'm a pastor. You fill in your blanks of who you are. And when the hard times hit, does it paralyze you and, and cause you to just just uh, shy away into a corner and, 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 and wonder, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? What is it that you want me to know about this? And, and someone calls you up and says, well, you, did you go to your doctor's appointment? No, I'm trying to figure out what God wants me to do. But did you pay the No, God, you know what? You need to be obedient. Move forward. What's the next thing to do? And God may reveal something more about it, but in the meantime, focus on being obedient to the Lord. Because that leads us to say this now, secondly. Do what you can to lessen the hardship. Look at verse um, 28. And one of them named Agabus stood up, chapter 11, verse 20, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there will be great famine over all the world. So, The disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea, and they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. And there it is. Notice briefly, they talked about it. Uh, they had to because they determined. So the disciples determined. Plural. Pl the disciples determined. They came to some kind of, of unifying agreement, uh, conclusion of, uh, and unity of what we're going to do. Do what you can to lessen the hardship. You may need to talk to it. We may need to get together. What do we do now? Let's talk about it. They examine their own personal budgets. It says everyone according to his ability. So they all determine, and now it's, what am I capable of doing? Uh, what am I not capable of doing? What are the limitations of my ability of getting involved? How far can I expend myself? So everyone according to his own ability. Also, they acted like a community and entrusted the elders to shepherd the flock. They acted like a community. This is, these are two churches that are separated from miles and miles and miles and miles and, and even, even more uh, separation, uh, culturally speaking, absolutely. But they're functioning like a, a community. Uh, they're together uh, on this. They're, they are unified. So here comes a famine, and we all know what famine meant in those days and in still today in many parts of the world. What does a famine mean still today in many cultures around the world? 
economic disaster. It's a wipeout. You're done. You're done. A kind of hardship that, uh, that uh, no one ever wants to experience. Made me think about economic disaster. When times are tough, what does the church cut from its budget? Our budget meeting's coming up. You know, we're past several years, we've been working on what's called a bare bone budget. I mean, we are literally bare boning. We don't owe any, we don't owe anyone. We get our bills paid at the end of the year, and we prove every single year that this is a non-for-profit organization because we ain't making a dime here. <laughs> but we've got, we are busted again. We paid our bills, but it's just like, and we come out just barely in the black. Economic disaster, priorities. What do you do when, when there's an economic disaster? Will we cut the expansion of new stage lighting? Or will we cut Pregnancy Information Center from our budget? Stage lighting, Pregnancy Information Center, which is going to go? You better believe it. Here it will. And it's really unfortunate that that's not the way it happens so much in Christ modern Western Christianity. I think I'd rather go without electricity. We just play that thing with no amp. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but we're going to support Pregnancy Information Center. You know the church had to deal with stuff like that all the time. We as personal families, we have to deal with that. When hardship comes, seeking advice, the Lord is in this. Man, it's so distracting. Economic, financial pressure, it's so distracting. You can't, on, you can't get on with doing life. Well, wait a minute, that is doing life. You see? And it may take years to turn things around, but that's, that's ministry. That's life. So do what you can to lessen the hardship. Thirdly, I see in this text, make up your mind about the sovereignty of God and act on it. Um, there in verse 12, about that time Herod the king. Now, uh, that's straight out of the, it's a good Greek translation, and we don't have any more information about Herod, but as you know, the word Herod is like uh, the, uh, Pharaoh, and it's a title. It's not just a name, it's a title, and this particular Herod is the third in line. He's the grandson of Herod the Great. So let's just back up. Let's roll history back a, a bit. Herod the Great tried to kill baby Jesus. Luke chapter 2. He had a son, and they called him Herod Antipas. He presided over the beheading of John the Baptist and the crucifixion of Jesus. This Herod is the grandson of Herod the Great. He is actually Herod Agrippa I, and he is nephew to Herod Antipas. He is going to put an end to this group called, as we saw last week, this group called Christians that the unbelievers up in Antioch have called this group of people Christians precisely because they don't ever stop following Jesus no matter the cost. And Herod Agrippa I is jealous for popularity and he wants to keep things uh, uh, with a tight lid on it so Rome doesn't get upset. So, best thing to do is just go after the leaders and kill them. And the text says, about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. That's not James who wrote the book of James, nor the brother of James, brother of Jesus Christ, but the James, the disciple. There's several Jameses in the New Testament. And that is an understatement. Violent hands and with a sword. You do a little bit of research, you find out what he did. Have you ever seen Braveheart? It is brutal, brutal 
I mean, these guys had the corner market on what it means to torture someone, to get a confession, to get uh, someone to recant their faith and deny the Lord. He brutally, brutally tortured James and then finished him off with the sword. Violent hands, killing the leaders. Well, when I say make up your mind about the sovereignty of God and act on it, I reflect upon the first 11 chapters and how focused Luke is on helping us to understand that God is absolutely sovereign over the hard times. For example, I think one of the most beautiful statements that we have in Scripture is in, found in Luke chapter 2, verse 22, 23, and the same thing, about the same thing in chapter 4. I put you in remembrance of this because we were in Acts a year ago in those, cha in those chapters, and it says... Peter pointed at Herod, that Herod at that time, Herod, Pilate, you Jews and you Gentiles, you're all guilty with lawless hands. You have crucified the Son of Glory, him whom God the Father predetermined. So God's sovereignty was all over the cross of Christ. Talking about hard times. And God was completely sovereign over it, and yet they were responsible for their actions. I think it's important to make up our minds about the sovereignty of God and, and act on it. Here's why. James kept, evidently, it's clear, James kept telling the gospel and was willing to suffer for the implications of that. And even if the authorities tell you to be quiet like they told Peter and John back in chapter 5 and threatened them and whipped them, and they let them go and warned them, don't you ever say another word in that man's name again. And Peter just said, you know what? Sorry. <laughs> they went right back out into the streets and started talking about Jesus. And James is watching all this. He's seeing God absolutely sovereign over uh, the stress and distress and the hardship of what it means to follow the Lord. And evidently, he didn't back down. He kept saying, no. Nope. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and he suffered for it. It cost him his life. He remembers Stephen's martyrdom as well, whom God ordained. So he knows the cost, and James becomes a martyr in his late 30s or 40s. He's a young man, and some of us might think that, you know, what a wasted life to be in your late 30s, your early 40s at max, and, and, and uh, you just, you wouldn't, you wouldn't back off, and, and now... Uh, man, it would have been just better if you just tailored your message just enough so that Herod wouldn't be too upset and too jealous, and, and you could have spent your whole life maybe leave and go somewhere else and plant a church, and you, could, you can get back with being bold and brave and courageous and, and spot on with the gospel. You don't have to lose it. You know what? No. It's not a wasted life. It is not a wasted life. To live for Jesus and to be cut down in your late 30s, if that's what it means. It's not a wasted life. He va evidently valued the gospel over his own life. And speaking of the issue of prayer. So God is sovereign over my life. My life is in his hands. Psalm 139, 139, all my days were written in his book before, before there were any of them. So go live your life for Christ. Give your life for Christ at home, here and abroad, wherever it may be. Value the gospel your, over your own life because God is in control of all the hard times and this is ministry. It's not a distraction. And then pray to a sovereign God who ordains the beginning and the end of hard times. Because verse 5 says, So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. And Lord willing, when I get back, we'll be in verse 6, and we'll move through the chapter there. of That whole funny incident <laughs> of praying, and oh, it just can't be Peter. They are praying to a sovereign God who ordains the beginning and the end of hard times. That's why the, the book of Revelation is filled with numbers. God has ordained the beginning and the end of all of your hard times. All of them. 
And I like putting it this way. If God is not sovereign over the imprisonment of Peter, then why pray for his release? See, sovereignty does not undermine prayer. It emboldens it. It gives it backbone. Otherwise, if God, not, if God is not sovereign over your, in your hardship and in your trials and in your need and in your distresses, then why pray? If he wasn't sovereign at the front of it, he certainly can't fix it and get you out of it. No, sovereign does not undermine prayer. It establishes prayer. You have no reason to pray, no logical reason to pray if God is not sovereign. You have none. You have none. If God is not in control at the front of the misfortune, then what is the point of praying for a fortunate outcome? If God cannot prevent bad things from happening, then he cannot initiate good things to happen. It's just so discouraging to hear Christians botch the issue of sovereignty and prayer. And we're going to see more of it as persecution now escalates where we are in Acts. We're going to see more and more and more prayer and happy resolution resolved to say God is absolutely sovereign over all of this. It's beautiful. And we need this in the church. And it's disheartening and discouraging to hear Christians botch the issue of sovereignty and prayer as if, well, let's pray and pray that God will turn this into good. Well, where was he before it started to turn bad? Oh, he wasn't around. And God's not, you know, don't, don't pin this bad thing on God. Be careful. What about the cross? You see, the cross is by design God's wisdom and knowledge. Sovereignty does not undermine prayer. It gives it backbone. Finally, keep your wits about you during hard times. Oh, hard times unravel you, don't they? Yesterday, here's my hard time. I'm trying to get that wind star ready for this trip to West Virginia and Indiana. It's approaching 183,000 miles. I lift up the hood, and there's this my check engine light came on. Ah, took it up to AutoZone. What is it? The intake, the IMR whatever acronym, the intake manifold regulator, blah, blah, blah. What is that? So I go online, YouTubed it. IMRC 2002 Ford Windstar. There's a video. Oh, so that's what it is. Man, that's a pain in the neck to fix. Good grief. So I went out in the garage and I got my duct tape. <laughs> I'm serious. I opened up the hood. I said, I'll fix you. <laughs> and because uh, it's, it's a, it's a, there's this electrical box on the side of the engine near the front. And it's got um, like, a, like a rod coming in this side and this side. And on this side of the rod, it's got a flap that sends oxygen down the manifold when you start it up so it gets more oxygen and starts properly and the same thing on this side of the v6 and they're both broke and i lifted them up well you're not sticking open and that's the problem they'll stick they, they it shakes and it sticks well you're not going to stick open start it up runs fine Dis disconnected the the battery cable and then the, the nut to my positive terminal breaks. Oh, you dummy. And I go back and... So I duct taped it. No, I didn't. <laughs> I'll fix you too. Well, the car's running okay. It's got duct tape. And I'm taking, I always take duct tape with me. Always. And some wire, bailing wire. I can fix anything with bailing wire and duct tape. And I was still very thankful when I got in the van and it started and I went over, had to drop something over at Joey Nashley's and on the way over to where I needed to go quickly yesterday, I just driving, no check engine light, 
running fine. Battery terminal is good. Duct tape's holding. Hey, we're good to go. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I'm at peace. You know, this car belongs to you. And I'll get there, God willing. The Lord is good. And I started talking like that. Keep your wits about you during hard times, which means expect the appearance of inequality, but don't judge God. And here's why I say that. Expect the appearance of inequality, but don't judge God. And here's why. Why is James killed and Peter is still alive? And he gets out. I mean, he gets out in grand fashion out of prison. Now, take it, make it personal. There's a real family. There's real blood relatives of James, and there's real blood relatives of Peter. And if you're young in your faith, and this kind of hard time hits, you will lose your wits during hard times, and you will begin to judge God. Why is it so hard on me and not on him or her? Why is James, why was James so brutally murdered? And Peter, and Herod is planning. Herod is planning to do the same thing to Peter, but he has to wait until the feasts are over because then the Jews will really get upset. So he's just waiting for, the, for this feast thing to get over with, and he's going to do the same thing to Peter. And here comes the angel. Hey, Peter, get out. Let's go. We're getting out of here. And Peter lives a long life of ministry. But, so keep your wits about you during hard times. Don't begin to judge God just because it appears that there's an inequality of blessing coming from God and not to the other person. You can't sit in judgment on God. He knows what he's doing. Stay obedient. Keep your wits about you. Also, don't become bitter and angry because that's a consequence of feeling and thinking that it's not fair that my van goes through problems and your piece of junk never has problems. Or I'm going through hard times financially and I've done everything right, it seems like, and you're making all the wrong financial mistakes and you never seem to get burned. Or I'm taking care of my body and you're not, and I'm hurting and you're not. The inequality, the appearance of inequality as God deals with things, deals with this in a sovereign way, deals with life. Don't become bitter and angry about it. Watch it. If you're becoming bitter and angry, then it's because you're sitting in judgment of God and you've lost your wits about you for hard times. Wait for the worms to eat your enemy. Jackie Hindi would say, where is that found? <laughs> well, I'll show you. We'll get there. I can't, I love this text. Wait for the worms to eat your enemy. Chapter 12, verse 20. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. And he's furious. He is absolutely furious. that, And he killed all the guards that, quote, unquote, let Peter go. And he is just, he's, he's a madman on a rampage. He's at Mach 4 with his hair on fire, and he's ready to scorch and burn anything that gets in his way that has to do with Jesus. And here's what he does. Verse 21, on an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration, oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Worm food. Keep your wits about you during hard times because whatever it is and whoever it is that is making it hard on you, God does not look lightly over this. He's sovereign over it, but he's still a God of justice. Wait for the worms to eat your enemy. Justice is coming. Justice is coming. It's just a matter of time. And this will help you just keep on going on and persevering through hard times and understand it that this this is ministry this is not a distraction this is what it means to follow the lord whether they be big things or small things the lord is good i'm going to sing a verse in just a moment after we pray from william cowper who suffered mental disease for most of his life 
and still wrote glorious songs. And it wasn't a wasted life being locked up in an institution filled with depression, and God used this man. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for these truths, and you know all of our hard times, and you know what our church is going through corporately, you know what we are going through personally and privately. Lots of things to rejoice in, lots of things to be joyful about, but yet many things that truly bother us. And when we, when we look at the landscape of what it means to be a gospel-believing, preaching, joyful church in these days and what looks like that is coming down the road in this country, I don't see it getting easier to be a Christian. I see it getting harder. I see, I see possibly one day that, that, that a mayor of, a, of your city can uh, put forth subpoenas for all sermon transcripts and it will be illegal to not turn them over and you will be jailed it'll be real it won't be just playing games anymore so lord um help us to be faithful and understand that you are sovereign uh, over these hardships and these trials that this is actually the main business of what the church is to be about that we would keep our wits about us, Lord, and not take our eyes off of you. And even when our eyes are upon you, not to accuse you of being unfair in how you deal with your people and with the affairs of the world. So, Lord, our hope and trust is, is in you. And, and as William Cowper would, would put it, God moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. It's in your name we pray.